Hi, hello, hello, Minasan. Konnichiwa. Thank you so much for joining us today. As we celebrate Asian Pacific Heritage Month,、uh, we have a whole lot of different activities going on this month of May. My name is Yoshi Domoto. I am the executive director of the Japan America Society of Georgia. And I'm so thrilled that you are all joining us today、um, to celebrate AAPI Heritage Month. As we have a very special program today, talk about Uh, the Japanese American experience and how we can all kind of navigate today's social climate and、uh, work with people with、uh, different ethnic and cultural backgrounds. So, uh, but uh, without further ado, I would like to、uh, get started with our program. The AAPI Heritage Month、um, actually has a Georgia connection too. It's celebrated in May as one of the first uh, Japanese uh, immigrants、uh, to come to the US,、uh, came the month of May. And then, the month of May was designated as Asian Heritage Month by President Jimmy Carter, who was the governor of the state of Georgia before being president. So,、uh, wonderful to celebrate、uh, this month.、Uh, but without further ado, we'd like to introduce、uh, Dr. Paul Watanabe. Watanabe Sensei is a professor of political science and director of the Institute for Asian American Studies at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. He served on President Obama's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders and as the first chair of the U.S. Census Bureau's National Advisory Committee on Racial, Ethnic, and Other Populations. So he certainly is a, a very big expert、uh, on today's topic,、uh, and we are so happy that he is here with us today. So,、uh, Dr. Watanabe, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Yoshi, and thank you to the Japan American Society of Georgia for the invitation to come and speak with you today. And I want to thank the other panelists for joining me to lend their perspectives and expertise as well.、Uh, given your focus on navigating the social climate for Japanese Americans in the current situation, I must say it's a truly sad and sobering time given the fact that the anti Asian violence has been directed at Japanese Americans and the entire Asian American community. Now, there is nothing new about the causes of this treatment of Japanese Americans, of Asian Americans, of people of color, and immigrants in the United States. Indeed, the past has proven to be reflected in the present. The, and I want to focus on the roles of visibility and invisibility, of coalition building, of education, and on leadership in navigating this terrain. And leadership, since it is part of your,、uh, my idea of responding to the situation, let me begin there and return to the other themes throughout my remarks. Now, let me set the scene. At September 12th, 2001, so day after 9 11, and here for the first time, the President of the United States, George Bush, has assembled together people in his cabinet and the congressional leadership in Washington, D.C. The first meeting after the attacks on, on the World Trade Center the day before. And he, and he makes a comment, and the comment is, seems a strange one to some people, but it will be appropriate and understood by the people here. And he turns to one of his cabinet members, Norman Mineta, who's the Secretary of Transportation and the first Asian American and Japanese American to serve in a cabinet. He's the Secretary of Transportation in the Bush administration, although a Democrat, he's a, a, he serves in the Republican administration. And President Bush says, We don't want to have happen to what happened to Norm and his family and the, and the people, his community. We don't want to have happen to the, to, the, to, the, to the people here who are Muslim and Arab descent what happened to Norm and his family after Pearl Harbor. And that was an important moment because here is the President of the United States recognizing that there may be a link between that other day of infamy that we call the, the,、uh, the Pearl Harbor attacks and this new day of infamy on 9 11. And this tendency, as we did in that first Pearl Harbor、uh, episode, to punish people of Japanese American descent, of Japanese descent here in the United States. For what had happened by the Japanese government, not by them, but by the Japanese government, to which they, they, they are many of them found is a country of their descendants, but not a country of their origin, not from countries to which they are, have any loyalty, or indeed, as most of the people who are placed in America's concentration camps, they were citizens. They were the young and the old. There are people like my brother, born five days before Pearl Harbor. It didn't matter. He was placed in America's concentration camps. Or you could be as old as 90 or 95 or even 100 and place in America's concentration camps during World War II. 
So President uh, Bush, I think, wisely stated that we didn't want to have happen to what happened to Norm's family, happen to Muslim and, and Arab brothers and sisters here after 9-11. Now, the Supreme Court ultimate, and that, of course, what happened during World War II is the incarceration after World War II of Americans of Japanese descent, over 110,000 of them, after the Executive Order 9066 was passed in February of 1942. Now, the Supreme Court of the United States ultimately upheld in three important cases the constitutionality of the action taken in 1942. But Justice Jackson gave a, an important and impassioned dissent in the Korematsu case, and I just want to read that dissent. Justice Jackson said, the court for all time has validated the principle of racial discrimination. The principle then lies about like a loaded weapon ready for the hand of, of any authority. It lies around like a loaded weapon, he warned. Now that weapon unfortunately has been used or threatened again, not against only Jap people of Japanese descent, as Norman Mineta warned against, uh, uh, Muslims as well as Arab Americans could be the target. South Asians after 9-11 could be the target. Or, and, as, and a Gallup poll taken after 9-11 was asked Americans do they think Amer that Arab Americans or Muslim Americans should be placed in World War II concentration camps like Japanese Americans? And a third of Americans, it said only a third in the Gallup uh, language. I thought only a third. I thought it was incredible that a third of Americans felt that Arab and, and Muslim Americans should be placed in concentration camps like the Japanese Americans were placed under those camps in early 1940. And, and, these, and, and our Muslim brothers and sisters are subjected to special questioning, to detentions, to surveillance, to bans, et cetera. Recently, Asian Americans have been blamed for the pandemic, the coronavirus, certainly by the, Trump, by the President of the United States, Donald Trump. Uh, he gave a face to the virus and the face was a Chinese or an Asian one. And he has tied Asian Americans to the countries of origin of their descendants. Once again, he has blamed Asian Americans for what has been perceived called the China virus or the Wuhan virus, knowing that it would, might bring, in fact, the kind of retribution it has wrought against people of Asian descent here in the United States. Indeed, as people in Atlanta know, that Asian Americans have been shot, they have been shoved, they have been stabbed, they have had liquid poured on them, they've been shoved, they, they've been scorned, they've been impacted by a variety of micro and macro aggressions aimed at them. The threats have been increasing against Asian Americans and they have continued for, uh, and intensified over the past year, but there's in some ways nothing new about it. Scapegoating has been embraced by, prime, by powerful people and ordinary people in the United States. And of the powerful people, you can't get more powerful than the President of the United States, who in fact embraced this sort of disdainful attitude towards uh, our, our Americans of Asian American descent, including Chinese Americans, but including Asian Americans of Japanese descent as well. Now, Japanese Americans have been framed in terms of the American experience as perpetual foreigners. And what this means is that some degree that they have been perceived as outsiders, no matter how long they've been here in the United States. And it's been pointed out by Yoshi the first one is said to be John Manjiro, who came in, the, in Bedford, Massachusetts, actually about 30 miles south of where I am right now, as part of a whaling boat where he was picked up, he was captized at sea in a whaling uh, a boat in, out of New Bedford, Massachusetts, picked him up and brought him to the United States. And yet, uh, since this period of time, the, the Asian Americans have been perceived as perpetual foreigners. They have been uh, led to they have been faced with racialization as outsiders, no matter how long they've been here. They've been perceived as not truly American, their loyalty somewhere else rather than to America. It led to immigration restrictions and restrictions on citizenship. It should be known that if John Manjiro, the first immigrant to the United States would have tried to become a citizen, he could not by law have become a citizen. Asian Americans could not come, become citizens even though they're immigrants to the United States, uniquely so. Indeed, Japanese Americans like myself could not become citizens of the United States until about 1952. If you're an immigrant to the United States, you could not naturalize a citizen until about 1952. So in other words, longer experience of Japanese immigrants in the United States for a longer period of time, we could not become citizens than the period of time we are, are allowed to become citizens. 
And of course, we've been excluded in 1883, beginning with Chinese exclusion, but that extended ultimately to all Asian immigration by 1924. Our civil and political rights have been denied. We have been subjected to segregated schools, Japanese Americans, as you know, prior to World War II, not on land, et cetera. And we know about the incarceration during World War II as the clearest expression of this perpetual foreigner framing. Vincent Chin, Wen Ho Lee, South, South Asians after 9-11, the violence in Atlanta, as we know, and the response to the health crisis are all reflections of this perpetual foreigner uh, uh, framing. Other groups, Muslims and Arab Americans have also been framed in this way and children families on the southern border have also been treated as though they're perpetual foreigners with no right to come here to the United States of America. So what are the responses? And Yoshi has asked us to respond to some responses. Well, one of them is leadership. I asked my students who is the most prominent Japanese American that they know and mostly they say, well, of course you Professor Watanabe and then I sort of say, well, if you're grade grubbing, that's a good answer, but that may not be the answer. And recently, in fact, there is a, lot, a survey that was given, a national survey of 2,800 Americans asking them to name the most prominent ja Asian American that they could. And interestingly enough, 42% of those people could not name one Asian American as a prominent person, not a single person. Well, if you would have asked me this question, certainly over the period of time that I, that I have been mostly active, I would have come up with one answer. This is the name of a person that President Obama, when this person died at, the, at his memorial service in the Washington National Cathedral, said of this person that he was my earliest political inspiration. He showed me what might be possible in my own life. He was a man full of grace and dignity. That person was Senator Daniel Inouye, who's the second longest serving U.S. Senator in American history, President pro tem of the Senate, and the presidential succession. He was a Japanese American out of Hawaii. And one of the things that, 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 uh, that Daniel Inouye said in terms of leadership, he said that uh, in the address to the U.S.-Japan relations, he began by saying, my remarks are primarily on two elements of a sovereign relationship, the military security relationship and the trade or industrial relationship. However, there's another element in all productive and friendly sovereign relationships, and that is the people to people relationship. And the significance of that is something that I think the Japan American Society understands. They focus on the people to people relationship. When leadership fails, we see as the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Removal of Civilians says that it was a failure of leadership that contributed to the incarceration of Japanese Americans. And I would argue, and that was President Roosevelt, I would argue that the failure of leadership that contributed to the attacks on Asian Americans, including Japanese Americans, was a failure by President Trump, another president here more recently. A second response is coalition building. The Asian Americans are the conscience of the nation. They must be when we talk about these issues. J Asian Americans must be part of those who fight for racial justice and against, against mistreatment. Sudu for solidarity is a very good reflection of that commitment. When our Arab and Muslim brothers and sisters are attacked, Asian Americans must be part of those who stand up with them. When our black brothers and sisters and our Latinx and indigenous communities are being attacked, Asian Americans must stand with them because that is the funda foundation upon which Asian Americans must recognize our role and how we have been treated as people of color. And finally, let me say as a response, education must be a response. For almost 35 years, I have been one of the rare people who have taught a class, actually I now teach two classes on the World War II incarceration of Japanese Americans. And every year in one of the classes, I try, it's a research class and a lecture class. In my research class, I try to take students to California to go to Little Tokyo and go to Manzanar or Tule Lake. And I try to let them think about what this experience would be. And I continually teach this course, not because I want them to simply look at this relic of the past, but because unfortunately there are constantly reverberations about what the lessons of the World War II incarceration of Japanese Americans tell us about what's happening today. And it continues to have that sense. And, and this past time, I taught this in the fall of 2020. I don't think I ever got more students ever before. I had more students in that class than ever before. And interestingly, they are particularly Latinx and Arab and Muslim students. They outnumbered the Asian students in the class because they understand the connection between what's happening to them and what's happening to their Japanese American brothers and sisters. 
So let me, in closing, answer the question, what is leadership? What does it mean? What does it mean to be an ally? It is not waiting to see in what direction the winds are blowing and the crowd is moving and then to just jump ahead of it. It can be running against the popular tide for a principle, a sacred value against an injustice. That's what Ralph Lazo did. And I wanted, if people don't know the story of Ralph Lazo, Ralph Lazo was a high school student in Los Angeles High School in 1942 when the internment order came out. Ralph Lazo is not a name that's a Japanese American name by any means. He was part Mexican and part Italian. But when he saw that his friends were dragged out of high school and being sent to internment camps, he said, I am going with them. Now, of course, he didn't have to go. He was, he was, a, he was not a Japanese American. But he said, in solidarity with his friends, I'm going to go into these concentration camps with them. And so he did. He voluntarily went and he was sent to Manzanar. So this is, this is somebody who stood up as an ally who didn't have to. Indeed, because of what Japanese Americans have experienced, we should resist walls to exclude immigrants. We must not forget that Japanese Americans have themselves been regarded as agents of a foreign influence, as undesirables, as threats. If there was a wall in 1940 along the Mexican border, it might have been the, prevented my father to come in the United States and he came across that border illegally, I will say in, 19, in the 1930s, because he couldn't come legally after 1924. Today for you and me, it means never forgetting what was done during World War II to honor their sacrifice and suffering by, by resisting calls to, uh, to employ ideas of collective guilt, to ban uh, bro our brothers and sisters and another group here, and we cannot serve as bystanders while they are treated badly by our government, either at the border or in airports and being banned to come here to the United States. So in summary, Japanese Americans, about a million of us today, are a strong community, but one which is embedded in a painful past. This is our duty as, as Japanese Americans, our obligation based on perhaps for some of you shared race and ethnicity as Japanese Americans are based on something we all share and Ralph Lazo recognized our shared humanity. This is why we must join together to support our Japanese American colleagues in fighting for the rights of all of our colleagues, people of color, of immigrants, of, of undocumented, of the oppressed, and those who are considered threats by the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Watanabe. I know Japanese Americans, we have a very unique history um, uh, here in the United States and uh, similar to you know, Asian Americans uh, and actually African Americans, uh, Hispanic Americans, uh, I think all minority groups. Uh, you know, we all have a very unique story to tell, and certainly uh, the Japanese Americans uh, have uh, endured a lot in, in our history. Um, but, uh, you know, as we are all proud to be Americans, um, it's still sobering um, that a lot of our minority groups um, have had a lot of challenges in our history. So but we really appreciate your insights uh, about Japanese American and Asian American uh, Heritage Month and kind of what it means uh, to be uh, Japanese American. So... Uh, but uh, at this time, we'd like to introduce our all-star group of panelists, a, a very important conversation we'd like to have uh, about uh, how to navigate uh, today's uh, social climate. Uh, we have Ms. Nozomi Morgan, Ms. Ramona Houston, and Ms. Vicki Flyer Hudson. So if I can ask uh, each one of you, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you grew up, how you grew up, your family, and kind of your journey into becoming an expert in intercultural communication uh, and the champion for social justice. Yes, hello everyone. Um, I'm Nozomi Morgan, CEO of Michiki Morgan Worldwide. And Yosan, thank you for the introduction. And um, Paul, thank you so much for sharing the history. Um, even though um, being Japanese, I, I know much of it, but still every time I hear this, it, um, it, I get really emotional. So if, 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 I, if you sense that, it is, it is because I do get emotional hearing this story every single time. Um, so Michigan Morgan Worldwide, the company um, that I run, we are, an, we are an intercultural leadership consulting firm, and we help global leaders, teams, and corporations to overcome the tension and frustration that naturally arise from cultural differences. And, you know, we are called in when multicultural companies um, have critical need to improve quality, performance, profitability through building a culture of excellence and inclusiveness. 
And what motivates me to do this work, um, to just kind of share my journey here, it comes from my experience as, as a child. So I was born in Japan and I came to the States when I was six months old with my father's work. So he was an expat of a Japanese company. So we lived in Seattle. So I actually um, grew up um, meeting in, with some Isenises, um, the Japanese Americans first generation. Um, so I went to public schools uh, during the day and uh, during the week, I should say, on, on Saturdays, I'll go to Japanese school, which um, is called Hoshuko. So I had this mixed culture within my own family that my family would speak Japanese at home, but I'll speak English outside of, of the house. And then um, my father's term in the States ended when I was eight years old. So we went back to Japan and then I grew up, spent the rest of my life, most of my life in Japan. And I decided to come back um, as an adult to um, get my MBA. So I came back later in my, um, after 10 years working in advertising in Tokyo. And um, the interesting thing then was um, I worked for Northwest Airlines after my business, uh, after business school. And some of you, since you're in Atlanta, a lot of you are in Atlanta, you might know it merged with Delta Airlines. So that's what brought me down to Atlanta. And through that experience of this major merger, I saw firsthand how employees like myself, um, employee groups, I should say, that, that doesn't have a strong representation, doesn't have a strong voice, really quickly and easily gets marginalized and, and just gets lost in the huge process of um, this, the, 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 the merger. So that was a catalyst for me to start Michiki Morgan Worldwide and to help to develop global leaders and organizations who can really listen to the voices and see the differences, see the diversity and work beyond these cultural differences and, and boundaries because I believe when you are able to do that, when you are allies, when you are um, have that coalition, when you're working together, this this world will be a better place. So that's my journey, and I'm so honored to be here today. Thank you so much, Nozomi san. And, and now, uh, Dr. Ramona Houston. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much to the uh, JASG for inviting me to be a part of this uh, wonderful discussion. And Dr. Paul Watanabe, it was such a pleasure to hear your lecture and how you got in all that history in about 15 minutes I, is excellent. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the the panelists. Uh, I'm honored to be here with you, Nasomi and Vicki. Uh, I am Ramona Houston. I am a native of Texas. And I my history is that I came from a family uh, uh, who really believed in developing multicultural and multiracial relationships. So I attribute my interest in multiculturalism uh, to my parents and to my grandparents. Uh, my grandfather, Benny Will Houston, uh, was a, a true integrationist and he truly, he was the first black elected official in Brown County and he truly believed in different groups of people working together to create impact in their communities. So because of my upbringing, uh, it grew into my interest in studying history. Uh, my PhD is in American history, where I focus on American race relations, specifically its African American and Mexican American dimensions. And what I work to do as a person who's interested in the history of different groups of people is to try to figure out what brings people together in order to solve social challenges and what keeps them separate. And so that's what my research is all about. But now as an entrepreneur, I serve as a social impact strategist. And that's where I help companies and public figures who want to impact their communities and want to make a social impact I help them to design and execute their social impact visions. I'm one of those people who believe that businesses have to be solutions to the global challenges uh, that face our society. And so it is a pleasure uh, to become involved with JASG. I've been a member uh, because of a uh, consul. Takashi Shinozuka, uh, who I developed a relationship with and who uh, encouraged me uh, to get involved in the Japanese community. So that is how I became involved. And it is a pleasure to be here to discuss 
um, how we can get beyond the racial borders that keep our community separate. Great, wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, Ms. Vicki Flyer Hudson. Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, wherever you are in the world. I'm Vicki Flyer Hudson, and I'm the Chief Collaboration Officer with High Road Global Services. And uh, we help clients build a roadmap to cross cultural competence and have effective dialogues across polarized views uh, through workshops and mediation. I was um, very honored to be asked uh, to be part of this panel. I've been involved with um, JASG for many years now. And I was born near Boston, Massachusetts to the descendants of Jewish immigrants. So I have always felt an affinity with the Japanese and Japanese American community because of unfortunately our common bond of history of concentration camps. And um, so it's, it's just been very meaningful to me to participate in these discussions because uh, there's a lot of emotion around that um, as uh, Nozomi said. So I grew up in LA and uh, that gave me exposure to kids from all over the world, all different backgrounds and mindsets. And I loved difference from day one, from the beginning of my childhood. And I had a dream to go to Asia. That was like my, my childhood dream. And I took my first trip there in 1996 and fell in love with adventure travel and ended up taking five leaves of absence from my corporate job. Actually, I quit five times and then got rehired by the same company. <laughs> And after uh, many, many years of doing this, I thought, well, maybe I ought to make something more meaningful out of it. So in 2004, I founded High Road. And um, the division and violence of the last five years or so have really motivated me to not only build bridges, but also to find potential ways to prevent what happened to Jews, Japanese Americans, African Americans, too, and so many others uh, from happening again. So the depolarization is my passion right now, and I'm, I'm very glad to be here. Great. Thank you so much. Well, uh, our first question goes to uh, Nozomi-san. Uh, so Nozomi-san, um, a little bit about my background. Uh, my father is Japanese, my mother is American. Uh, so kind of grew up in both cultures and I was actually born in Japan and moved to the States uh, when I was uh, very young. So I've had uh, the very unique and um, uh, fun um, experience of growing up uh, as both an American and Japanese. Uh, you know, I will have some challenges too, but um, you know, growing up, I, I didn't hear uh, anything about uh, the Japanese American internment or order 9906. Um, but when I did learn about it, I, I just kind of thought to myself how how could this happen um, in, in uh, America, you know, the land of the free and, um, you know, where we, you know, all certainly, um, you know, celebrate our differences and diversity. Um, well, it seemed to me at the time when I moved from uh, Japan to the U.S., um, but, um, so, but I think a lot of that kind of um, the, the, the reasoning or the background or the foundation comes from, from fear uh, ignorance, um, and a lot of other adjectives that I could use, but um, Nozomi-san, do you think kind of those uh, divisive mentalities still exist today um, among Japanese Americans and other minority groups? I know that's a tough question, but what do you think? Yeah, well, the answer would be yes, definitely. I think we see that um, more, I don't know if more and more, um, but definitely there's um, you know, these actions come from, from fear, fear of unknown, fear from differences, fear from, um, I guess coming back to really the unknown, something that's, and, and when I say unknown, meaning different from you, different from what you're used to. Um, and also I think it comes from a place of the mentality of like scarcity, meaning that we're, we're fighting over um, limited resources, limited um, space, limited this or that jobs. Um, when the truth is when we're actually, there's an, more than enough for everyone, but we're just so look, fighting over something that we think is just belongs to just us and we want to keep it just to us. Um, so kind of to your son's point, it's interesting. I actually, because um, my younger life I, I spent in Japan. So how I learned about the internment camp actually is through history. When they talk about World War II, um, that's where I um, learned about the internment camp. But uh, I didn't, at that time being in Japan, I didn't realize how, how wrong that was. It didn't sink in because I was looking at it for a Japanese um, standpoint of, of course, if it's someone who's um, 
the, the enemy of your country, that makes sense, right? Just from a very simplistic uh, point of view. And it didn't hit me until I actually moved to the States, came here and realized that, oh, wait, if you're you know, American, you're a citizen, you are a citizen, you're not the enemy of this country. So I think also, I, I also, um, so the, you know, the xenophobia that a lot of Asian Americans are experiencing, um, you know, Paul ex talked about that, that being, you know, a perpetual foreigner. Um, you know, that's a concept I think is, is very interesting and very difficult for a lot of us to, um, to comprehend. I think it's something is so subconscious at this point, like you really have to intentionally um, think around that. And, and you know, because the society, right, because you frame it in that way, the way you're portrayed, like in movies or, or um, you know, or education or the way we talk. Um, personally, I have an experience of that myself being, having my own business. I, um, there was a company that wanted to hire us to do some kind of management training. And um, our office is actually less than 10 miles from this company. And they eventually chose to work with someone else. Um, and I asked, you know, as a proud business owner would do, um, why did you, you know, why, why did you choose the other company? And they said, it's because we were not local enough. And when I say local enough, I don't think it means that we're physically, you know, geographically local enough. I think they're actually saying they didn't think we, our company was American enough for them. Um, so it's, it's really, and, and, and I think that person said it really subconsciously. I don't think they knew what they were saying. Um, so yeah, there's uh, so many of those. I think that also, again, comes from fear. Like they, they felt like it had to be a company that looked in, in that person's mind American unless we can't hire this company. Um, so I, yeah, it's, there's, there's so many stories to tell even till this day. Um, like I can probably, if you ask me tomorrow, I have a new story for you. Thank you so much. I know, um, you know when we want change, it starts with an honest conversation. And I'm so glad that you're able to share you know, your feelings and experiences. So, um, but uh, Dr. Watanabe, I'm going to ask you to kind of uh, shed some positivity now. I know the Japanese American internment um, uh, was one of the darkest times in American history, but um, you know, a lot of you know, some positive things came out of it too, uh, in that you know, a lot of families were united or started um, because of the internment. There was the 442 um, during the war. Um, and then um, it kind of showed uh, the Japanese Americans, like many other Asian American communities and also minority groups, um, you know, kind of showed their strong resiliency, resurgence, uh, you know, the gaman mentality. Um, so maybe you can kind of talk about some positive things that came out of the internment. Um, and uh, maybe after that, we'll kind of go into what we can do moving forward. And Paul, sorry, you're on mute right now, so you can unmute yourself. Sorry, I, I guess I've never been asked to talk about the positive aspects of the internment because I think it's all relative, and maybe it is relative that the community survived, certainly, to a considerable degree. But I, I think in some ways that was the narrative a long time ago, that Japanese Americans did the shikata ganai sort of attitude that they they bore this terrible burden and that they survived and then they ended up being prosperous and well-educated and, and all of that and they succeeding in America. I think that was the narrative behind the internment and I think it was a wrong narrative myself. I think the narrative is that a community that goes through something like that cannot go through something like that undamaged and it had a lot of damage to it. And I think there were resistors, people who resisted this effort and they were not, and they were shunned and they were short, scorned by our own community for their resistance to what was happening to them. And so I think I, I, there's little positive I can take from this experience. And uh, other than perhaps, and I, I do think this sounds a little uh, around about sort of your conception of what's positive, except for people who have suffered this, the people who have suffered this experience have felt a particular responsibility. And there are so many Japanese Americans who have felt the responsibility that this shouldn't, in the, in the name of the, as the Jewish people say, and, and, and Vicky knows this, that it should never again happen to somebody else. And that never again attitude is something that really reflects 
the, uh, the, the working with Muslim youth, for example, to try to give them support during their hour of need, to fight for people on the southern border, the children and the, and the families that are being detained, and to fight for people today in the larger Asian American community being targeted for abuse. If, if, that's, if that's a burden, I think some people should perceive it, but I see that's a gift because it's a gift of trying to really make something good out of something that happened bad. And if, that, if that's something good can, can come from this experience, then I think that that's possibly the best thing to come from, from, the, from this terrible experience that Japanese Americans have felt. Thank you, yeah, and I completely agree that um, kind of the, the strength and resiliency of Japanese Americans um, have made it possible for them to, uh, as you mentioned, that uh, to ensure that this never happens again, right? And I think many Japanese Americans um, have been very vocal uh, in kind of different um, kind of social uh, things happening. Uh, so, so thank you very much. Um, for my next question, I would like to go to um, to Ramona. Um, so, so we have very complex and challenging history, uh, I guess, here in the U.S. What can individuals, organizations, communities, and even companies do to bring people together to promote cross-cultural and cross-racial relationships? Yes, first, I want to really talk about this term American. Uh, words matter. And a lot of times when we say American, we uh, really center whiteness. American is supposed to be white. And I think that we need to rephrase what American is. American is all people and citizens who live in America. And we shouldn't always look at white people as the only Americans. And so uh, if we are going to refer to white people, we need to say white, uh, Japanese American, African American, whatever, but not use the term American as synonymous with whiteness. I think that's one of the things because words do matter. Uh, in terms of building multiracial and multicultural relationships and partnerships, it all begins with the individual. The individual must first decide that they want to build uh, relationships outside of their own uh, uh, groups. Uh, they have to decide, the individual has to decide that they want to be in organizations, that they want to be a part of institutions that uh, are beyond their own cultural comfort zones. And as we do that, then we get our organizations and our institutions within our communities to build partnerships and coalitions with like-minded people and groups. And so I think it begins with the individual. It, and as Dr. Watanabe stated, uh, it begins with leadership, the leadership within our communities, the leadership within our organizations and institutions must provide the motivation and the inspiration to work with people outside of our cultural zones, uh, our uh, comfort zones, excuse me, and then we can begin to move forward uh, with groups. But also as individuals, we have to not allow the dialogue that occurs within our families and communities that are negative against other people to continue. And we have to call it out for what it is. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, next question is for Vicky. Um, so Vicky, um, no, Nozomi-san kind of talked about the unknown fear, ignorance, that kind of leads to um, a lot of, um, uh, I guess, challenges um, and, um, what causes escalation, do you think, in difficult conversations? How can you manage these kind of emotions, especially among people with like polarizing views um, on kind of extreme ends of this, uh, the spectrum? Um, and what strategies can you implement to achieve effective dialogue? Yeah, so there's kind of good news and bad news around polarizing conversations. The, and, and they're both the same. Uh, they don't tend to deviate much um, in terms of people tend to respond in a very ritualistic way that is predictable. So it kind of starts out where some faction experiences a sense of threat. And then they start to gather with like-minded people for support and advocacy to feel safe, which can be good. But then when you start to demonize the other side, that's where things really start to break down. And when people are threatened, they start to narrow their perception of themselves and others. And as the threat sense rises, the gulf widens. And it's just a self-perpetuating system. 
So the good news is that because it's predictable, we've had a while to kind of study what are some of the things that break the cycle. And as a Jew, I've been particularly interested in that because as I see the rise of anti-Semitism today, obviously I'm quite terrified. Uh, and, and of course it's um, the, the violence against Asian Americans, the root cause while the details may differ, but that fear is, is there at the heart of it. And so a lot of the techniques that need to be used are around managing the emotions. So everything from being able to pause before you speak. So there's a, a, a rule that I probably some of my colleagues on the, on the call will recognize the four second rule. There's some research out of Columbia University that says if you pause four seconds, uh, it allows your brain chemistry to shift from that limbic system to the prefrontal cortex. And I have found this extremely effective that when someone is sharing a view with me that seems very counter and very wrong in, in certain ways, that just counting that to myself and you know pausing before I speak allows me to have a more intentional response that may short circuit that demonization process because I'm as I'm as susceptible to, to that as anyone. If someone shares a view that's very counter to mine, I'm also susceptible to start to say other, other, and otherize that person and demonize them. So I think that because of the Jewish history, I, I've actually become very committed to listening to views that are counter to my own, to try to understand where people are coming from. And it doesn't mean I can't be clear and direct when I think something is wrong, but there's a difference between being clear and direct and demonizing somebody and, and labeling them and therefore not seeing any of the nuance in how they feel and their value system. So I think that's something that we have lost sight of somewhere along the way. And unfortunately, the, the history, the cycle of history just seems to repeat itself over and over. But we need to come back to being able to see nuance in people and not just sort of place them in a box of, you know, well, you, you've, you voted Democrat or Republican, so you must be this. And kind of get back to a little bit more complexity and being willing to listen. So. Um, one of the main ways that I found that works is just giving people structure like to their conversation. So rather than just arguing back and forth about positions, having maybe sort of a structured conversation. So we do that with some of our clients where we'll have them, we give them a format for the conversation and there's ground rules and there's uh, an agenda and there's kind of suggestions around how to listen. And we find that that helps a lot more than just allowing people to go back and forth, digging their heels in on their position. So those are just some of the things that have worked for, for me. Great, thank you so much. Um, Nozomi, some a kind of similar question for you. Um, I know kind of the Japanese American um, and Asian American kind of value systems a little bit different. Um, you know, I think over the years things have changed and uh, as Paul mentioned, more and more Japanese Americans and Asian Americans are able to um, kind of voice their um, you know, feelings and uh, kind of uh, you know uh, speak out uh, against hate and violence uh, recently. Uh, but what are specific strategies that you know, Japanese Americans, Asian Americans uh, can use to tackle you know, the same challenge, especially considering that you know our culture may not welcome speaking up and speaking out, um, and it might be better to kind of uh, you know, fit in with the, with the group, right? So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I, um, I yeah, that's, a, that's a, such a great question. So we work with a lot of um, Asian professionals as well. And one of the things is really the challenge is to overcome the voice within your head and really being able to be true to yourself and not being constrained by the culture, the programming that we've been um, living through, you know, especially in Japan, there's a saying, a nail that sticks out gets hammered in. And that's been ingrained in the school system. I um, remember clearly, you know, when I was a child, I spent my first eight years in the States. And um, I remember that what's important was to be being different and being unique was valued. Like that's what I took away, even at that, at that age when I went back to Japan um, and went to the Japanese you know, normal public school. 
And when the teacher asked a question, like something like, who knows the answer? I'll be like, you, me, me, me. <laughs> and I was the only person in the classroom like, raising my hand because in Japanese culture, me, me is not <laughs> valued. And I quickly learned that, right? No one taught me, but you can just feel the pressure um, in the air. And quickly, you know, at eight years old, I knew to never raise my hand ever, ever again. Um, and that's a programming that really creates your way of thinking and that's subconscious. And then it, and that impacts your behavior, the way you think, what you do. So for a lot of us, um, especially who, who, and it's not just the Asian culture, you know, there's a lot of cultures that are, that are like that, um, is to really... Uh, going back to the, the principles and, and believing in what you, you know, what's right for you and pushing away those programmings, those trainings, those cultural norms that you have been, you know, brought up in. And it's, it's important, but also it's important to, you know, honor your heritage and all that, but it's, it's even more important to be true to yourself and, and being, you know, standing in that power. And even when it's, um, hard and scary it really is the first step is to take that that step out that courage and you know and being with people um, that have that same um, what do you call it same passion same same um, like-minded people you know being in those groups and you know already in this conversation we talked about allyship and coalitions and you know being part of groups um, I think really that's how you can start strengthening yourself and, and the more you speak up the more you're, you you put yourself out there the more you'll 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 empower yourself too um, so I really think you know this talking about strategy but really it comes starts with yourself and knowing what's true to you and 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 being able to hear your own voice, not what the voice that your family taught you, not what the, you know, the society tells you, but what's your own voice. Thank you so much, Nozomi san. I know that's uh for, for many of us Japanese Americans and Asian Americans, it's easier said than done, but it, it's kind of a um a lifestyle that you have to really embrace and kind of live every day, right? So I'll certainly have to work on that myself. Um, but uh, Ramona, next question. Um, so as um, I, I mentioned this a little bit, and then also Nozomi-san did too, you know, we didn't really learn about uh, the Japanese internment or kind of the history, um, you know, of kind of minority groups until we took, you know, history classes um, in, in school. Um, can you talk a little bit about kind of um, America's educational system, um, how K-12 and also, I guess, higher education, what, you um, you know, professors uh, like yourself uh, and Dr. Watanabe and others, uh, and then also kind of leaders within the academic and education world do better to be able to kind of uh, kind of promote intercultural exchange uh, and social justice. Yes, I must admit, uh, my first time hearing about the Japanese internment camps was when I was an undergrad. Uh, I went through K through 12 without hearing any type of uh, Japanese American history. And so uh, my undergraduate class has really opened me up to studying different, um, different histories, including African-American history, which I never had gr growing up as well. So when we look at the educational system, it, whether we're talking about public education, K through 12, or, what, or whether we're talking about higher education, uh, it all begins with advocacy. Uh, African-American history did not, uh, uh, and ethnic studies did not begin just because uh, higher education, uh, higher education institutions just felt that they wanted to bring it, bring it in. It had to do with uh, advocacy. And we know that the student movement, we know that the civil rights movement, uh, the various movements that happened during the 1960s and 70s resulted in those ethnic studies programs and the expansion of um, uh, the study of different groups of people and the expansion of professors who actually uh, focus on various aspects of uh, different 
cultures and communities in the US. And the only way we'll be able to make sure that Japanese American experience is included in the curriculum is through advocacy. Uh, that, and it's not just up to the Japanese American community to advocate for inclusion into the core curriculum. It has to be all of us and recognize that all of us, whether we're uh, Japanese American, Chinese American, African American, American, Native American, Indigenous groups, all Chinese American, all of us have contributed to the development of what America is today. And to really understand American history, we have to include all of us into uh, the study of America to show how we have contributed to making this great country what it is today and what it will be in terms of our contributions uh, to our society. Great, thank you so much. Uh, as um, we will start our kind of an audience Q&A session uh, momentarily. So if you do have a question for our panelists, now please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen uh, and we will try to get to all of your questions. Um, uh, but uh, Vicki, before we do that, I wanna ask you, um, you know, you, you spoke about, you know, contrary to popular belief, it is realistic to have civil conversations and accomplish goals with people whose views and, um, you know, counter your own, right? So, but to solve all our challenges, you know, we need a common language. What is that language if it's not English? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the common language, and this is, is tricky because sometimes we feel that to build bridges, we have to find common ground, which is not always true. I mean, sometimes building a bridge is building it from one side to the other, right? But I do think the common language is just recognizing the humanity in people and, and moving away from positions into interests. Because when people are frustrated about something, it usually means that they care deeply about something underneath that frustration. So the position might be, I want this, like a demand. But the interest underneath that is I care about my kids' safety or, you know, and there often is more commonality underlying in interest than there is in positions. And I think, again, thinking about all these histories of oppression and uh, violence, at the root of all of that was dehumanization. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said I count myself in people who are absolutely capable of dehumanizing, because we all are. And so... Um, I think civil conversations are about curiosity, that we have to, you know, to what extent we can remain curious. And I know there's a lot of complexity in that in terms of privilege and power and all of those things are playing into it, that someone might have a more difficult time being curious about an opposing view than someone else due to privilege and power. Um, but thinking about what experiences might have helped shape that person's perspective that has that divergent view what are the life experiences? What are the fears underneath that they might have that's helping shape that view? And what small point of agreement might we be able to find with them simply for the purpose of not agreeing with maybe a, a wrong view that they have, but finding again that common humanity so that you can then move into sharing your perspective. So I like to use a technique where if I'm listening to an opposing view, first I just clarify what I heard the person say. So I'll say like, it sounds like you're saying this, and then I'll find some point of agreement with them. Like I, I agree that healthcare is too complex and could benefit from some revision. Uh, and then I usually signal them that I'm gonna share my perspective. And so I'll say, you know, this issue really hits home with me. Can I share my perspective? And then I'll focus on the way I see it as a Jew, for example, or the way I see it is this, instead of saying, this is how it is. And 90% of the time that works pretty well. So I guess staying in curiosity to what extent we can, we all have issues where we're like, no, I'm, I'm just not gonna debate that and I'm not gonna negotiate that and that's fine. Uh, but staying curious and seeing that common language of humanity, I feel is uh, something that might help prevent some some levels of depolarization. Yeah, definitely. I think. Yoshi, can I comment just on some of the wise things that have been said by the panelists? In yes, the please. Well, to Vicki, I, I may even, don't even have to take four seconds to respond because I, you've given us a lot of wisdom in terms of how to do this. And I do think she's given us a common language, Yoshi, and that's the common language of people's hopes and fears. We all have those hopes and fears. 
and the way in which Vicki says that to have a conversation, let's say, for example, you have some poor person who's struggling, who may be white, who wants to blame their, their economic situation on somebody who's an immigrant from coming across the border from Mexico. And I think what Vicki is saying, you begin with the proposition that yes, we can all, we, there's something we can agree on, which is you're poor and you're not being treated well by this economy. But the question is, is it really that person across coming across the border from Mexico that's really making you or contributing to your being poor or there are other forces at work there? And I think that that's what she's suggesting. And I hope that that kind of thing really can lead to some sort of dialogue. And when Ramona talks about the idea of American, she really touched something to me. I, you know, a friend of mine went to a Japanese restaurant that opened a new one in the city the other day. And he was a white person. He came back and I gave me a review and I said, how was it? And he says, and he said, and he said, you know, he said, Paul, the way I knew it was a good restaurant is I went in there and the place was packed and I was the only American there. And I knew what he meant. He meant that he was the only white person there along with Ramona's suggesting. And I'll never forget in the 1998 Nagano Olympic Games in the women's figure skating when Tara Lipinski and Michelle Kwan were competing for the women's figure skating title. A, a banner across one of the major networks when they announced, I have a picture of it. If I had more time, I'd, I'd get up announced the winner of the women's figure skating uh, championship by saying American beats Kwan, American beats Kwan. It meant Tara Lipinski beat Michelle Kwan, but of course Michelle Kwan was also an American. She just happened to be Chinese American. And, and to uh, the point about visibility or invisibility, I couldn't be more uh, convinced that invisibility just is not gonna work for our community anymore. We thought it might work during World War II and look what happened to us. And I, I would say that if we were more visible in 1942, maybe it would have been more difficult to hurt us into places in the concentration camps. And certainly, hopefully in 2021, if we had to take Asian Americans and say, herd them in the concentration camps, we would have to throw the vice president of the United States into a concentration camp. We'd have to put people like Maisie Hirano, a United States Senator in a concentration camp. We'd have to put Tammy Duckworth, a United States Senator in a concentration camp. We'd have put Yo-Yo Ma in a concentration camp. We'd have put George Takei in a concentration camp. It's gonna be more different. And that visibility is critical to build upon. I think hiding being the nail that sticks out, we're gonna to have to recognize that being the nail that sticks out is gonna be something that we're gonna to have to work together on. And it, it does not give you any protection to hide in the corner and pretend that they don't see you because they do see you and they're gonna exploit you because of it. So thank you for all your insights. Thank you, Paul, that was really insightful. Well, we just have a couple minutes, so I um, want to get through uh, as many questions as possible. Uh, I guess we'll do a speed round, and if you can keep your uh, answers uh, very short. Um, but first one goes to Nozomi-san. Um, how are Japanese Americans in Georgia uh, controlling their public narrative using social media, uh, i.e. TikTok or I guess other platforms uh, to counterproductive, um, you know, American narratives or in perspectives within the AAPI community? Yeah, um, you know, well, as, as you know, social media is very personal, so I can definitely cannot speak about, you know, for everyone, but I know, you know, Japan American Society is doing a lot of on social media, They've, like you have podcasts, you have posts, you have these webinars. I know there's so many other um, Asian American um, related uh, organizations that are doing the same, especially I mean, this month being the Asian API Heritage Month, there's so many events, so many things going on. So we, I, I see ourselves um, really working towards talking about visibility, really making ourselves visible. And one thing is really talking about our stories. That's one thing, especially since last year, um, we've I, I found more and more important and more um, wanted is to hear our stories. I actually was just on a panel last week talking about Asian American women. Um, our, our challenges as professionals um, in the workplace. So I, I find ourselves um, doing more and more of that. And I see more individuals, you know, really speaking up, being more visible and sharing their stories, just like, um, you know, Dr. Bhattamba talked about the, the senators. I see more of them on TV uh, in different programs. Um, so I think that's how um, we can, at least we can really leverage social media, um, but I would love to see more. I think we can do more. Great, thank you. And speaking of social media, uh, we have a question from a proud millennial, uh, but um, uh, you know, uh, 
this person has come to grow up in the age of increasing cultural globalization uh, through technology uh, and cultural mixing of countries. Um, and uh, they hope that globalization uh, will kind of uh, bring together people in ethnic groups. Um, uh, but um, the question is, um, I guess uh, for Ramona, um, do you think, I guess, technology and social media, um, does it help, I guess, bringing people together or does it also bring its kind of own uh, baggage of challenges uh, when it comes to cross-cultural integration? Yes, great question. And I think it does both. Uh, you know, for the first time in our lives, we're able to communicate with people across the world and actually build relationships with them online through technology. Uh, we can associate with them, we can have conversations every day with them, which we didn't get to do before. But as Dr. Wat Watanabe said earlier, there's nothing like people to people relationships and that we have to continue to make personal connections beyond just those virtual connections. So I think it has to be both. You know, we live in a global society uh, where we're traveling across the world in a matter of hours, but at the same time, we need to continue to build relationships, personal relationships. There's nothing like uh, having a relationship with a friend or family member and being right next to them versus just being online. And we really need to make sure that we get to know each other both uh, personally and virtually. Well, great. I think you answered uh, the second question. So I, I think you uh, um, kind of killed two birds with one stone uh, about kind of in-person, uh, I guess, uh, interaction, right? So hopefully we kind of get back uh, into uh, more and more of that. Uh, but uh, the last question uh, is for uh, Dr. Watanabe and Vicky, please uh, join us too. Uh, what role does the news, the media, television and newspapers play in the positivity towards Japanese Americans? And Vicky, maybe you can talk about more uh, kind of the international community as a whole too. So Paul, maybe first uh, for you and then uh, with Vicky. And Paul, I'm sorry, you're on mute again. So one more time. Yes, there's the technological and global divide that I'm not having quite uh, captured all of this uh, technology yet. I was actually going to ask the question of Vicky and actually in, ask in a different way, which she's somebody really in the business of trying to have these conversations where people are marshalling evidence to talk about what, the, what their particular position is based on. And I'm, I'm going to pose the question to her in some ways, which is if you've been in the business long enough, if you've been in the business before the, there was heavy reliance on the internet as a basis for one's uh, uh, data, and there now is a heavy reliance. I see this in terms of my students. I will say that 80% of the sources they cite are now internet sources as opposed to books and articles and so forth. Do you think that that's made it more difficult in terms of the veracity and the credibility of the kinds of things that people marshal to make their cases and sort of these conversations that you've been describing or not? Does it actually enrich them? And, and in some ways, I think she's the real expert to answer, so I'll let her do so. Mm. Thank you for that, um, for that privilege, um, Dr. Watanabe. So I, I guess I would say kind of like Ramona's answer, I see positive and negatives to it. On the one hand, being able to, for example, connect on Facebook with someone in Nigeria, if you're living here in the US is a real blessing. I mean, this is something that you may not have had that connection in the past, but at the same time, you might develop a false sense of simplicity about the culture. You might think that because you interact with that person on social media, that you know the inner workings of Nigerian culture. Whereas if you went there and spent some time, you would probably realize very quickly that there's way more complexity than that. So the, the simplicity, sort of projected simplicity, I think is a challenge. The other thing that's a challenge is the algorithms of social media. So the, the second you click like on something, unfortunately, uh, let's say you click like on an article and you're, you are left-leaning in your politics and you click like on an article about uh, that's kind of left-leaning, Facebook and other uh, social media outlets are going to give you, feed you more of the same. So I think it's getting us into an echo chamber that's extremely dangerous. So I make it a point to ask my friends of this sort of opposite political persuasion to send me articles that they have read that they find meaningful to them. And then sometimes we'll talk about it um, so that I'm, I'm, sort of saying to myself, stay out of the echo chamber as much as possible, which is very, very difficult. And I do think the tech companies need to take some responsibility for that. So I guess I'll stop there. Wonderful, thank you so much. And I know this is a topic that we can 
talk for hours and hours, days and days and weeks and weeks. Um, but uh, this is certainly, a, a, I think, an important start. Uh, and I encourage everyone tuning in, including all of our panelists, to continue the conversation with your friends, family, colleagues. Um, and uh, I think for, for real change to occur, uh, you know, we all need to have honest conversations um, with um, people that may think alike or, you know, may have different point of views, right? So, so thank you again to all of our panelists uh, for joining us today and shedding uh, insights and uh, expertise uh, on today's topic. Uh, definitely uh, tune in for many of our other <laughs> events. Uh, thank you again to all of our panelists and we will see you next time. Everyone stay safe and be healthy. Take care. Bye. Thank you, everyone.